Thank you, Ali. And uh, if I may call uh, our panelists, and we'll just do this informally over on, uh, uh, on the seating ground. And perfect. And I think there are steps on that side, if anybody. Don't kill yourself on the way up. So we're coming to the point in uh, our first day at the summit where you probably have figured out that we have a bit of a schizophrenic agenda. Um, we are taking you through some incredible pieces of innovation and some technical talks from some superstars in our community. And we heard from uh, the likes of Bob Langer uh, some of their journey uh, through innovation as well as academic uh, research and discovery. But we're also talking to you about this uh, new breed of innovators that we're calling academic entrepreneurs. And we're talking a lot about translation and the need that, um, as for the debate that preceded us, uh, the need that it's not sufficient <coughs> to develop a um, a great publication or to receive grant funding in order to really advance the impact that the science and technology and innovation that we're all participating in ultimately delivers. And so um, today we're starting with a very ambitious title in this panel, which is to talk to you about megatrends that drive innovation. And the last few times I sat through presentations about megatrends, I found a group of experts that would give me a list of what the future will look like. What are the things that are going to drive the next uh, revolution? And uh, I actually follow this subject called futurology, um, which is made up of experts that would predict the future uh, in science and technology. And I went back to some of the predictions that uh, people made over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Very few of the megatrends they predicted actually happened. Mm -hmm. And very many megatrends they didn't predict ended up being the megatrends of reality. So in talking to you about megatrends today, I wanted to take a different approach. And I have assembled very different, and we're very honored to have some very different points of views represented in this panel. We're not going to do a debate. Sorry, Joachim, the way, <laughs> the way you did it. But what I thought we should do is talk from the perspective of uh, folks that are studying innovation, that are studying disruption, that, are, that have participated in the creation of um, a veritable revolution. Talk about what are the ingredients that make up megatrends and why are megatrends important? What, 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 what is it about them that ultimately scales at a very uh, uh, on a global basis and transforms the world uh, on a global basis. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves for just a quick minute. Uh, but what you will see is each one of them brings a completely different pers perspective and point of view and journey. And I'm hoping that it's in that diversity that we will have a very interdisciplinary uh, and interesting discussion. Uh, Paul, shall we start with you? Sure. So I'm uh, Paul Weiss. I'm on the faculty just up the hill here at UCLA. Uh, in nanoscience. I came to UCLA in 2009 to be director of the Nano Center. That's about a third science, third engineering, third medicine. I'm in uh, chemistry, material science, uh, bioengineering, the cancer center, and the stem cell <coughs> center. Uh, one of my achievements was bringing Ali to uh, UCLA uh, from uh, Harvard and MIT. Uh, I founded the journal ACS Nano, and Ali was uh, one of the associate editors. Uh, While well, I was editor in chief, and Dino DiCarlo, I think, is the only current associate editor uh, who's at the meeting here. And so we uh, work, I study in the laboratory the ultimate limits of miniaturization, which has let us develop new microscopes that have atomic resolution to measure structure, function, and spectra. And then we control uh, the placement of chemical functionality down to the nanoscale, which turns out to be the scale of function in biology and thus useful in what we're talking about today. Terrific, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Lyons. Um, I'm an associate professor at UC San Diego at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. 
Um, I study the economics of innovation. As part of that, I think about what increases the rate and impact of startups and entrepreneurship, also what improves the success of innovators um, as individuals and as teams. Um, and a subset of my research focuses on academic entrepreneurship in particular, so this is all very interesting for me. Hi, you know, Hi. I'm Peter Cowie. Uh, I was for many years the dean of the school that Liz shows that there's a bright future for despite <laughs> old horses like me. Uh, I, uh, along the way, have uh, spent my career especially on the areas of digital technology and public policy and did stints in both the Obama and Clinton administration dealing with many of these issues about technology. And uh, as a byproduct of that, I've been involved in a number of the international arrangements for technology markets globally uh, and have advised a number of companies. Hi, my name is Nazli Azimi. I am a scientist turned entrepreneur, or as I learned it, an academic entrepreneur. Uh, I started my career as an NIH. Uh, I was involved with discovering and characterizing some key cytokines that uh, led to some good publication and idea for starting to buy tech company, which I did. And um, I exited them last year. And since then, I'm joined a couple of biotech boards. And also, currently, I'm the chairwoman of the Tarasaki Leadership Board, helping the institute just to uh, do the great stuff that's doing. And Fadi? <laughs> Wonderful. My name is Fadi Shehade. I'm the CEO of a private equity firm based in Boston and Los Angeles. Uh, I started my career at Bell Labs and research, but then spent many years building uh, three companies from scratch, uh, sold them to IBM, Oracle, and different uh, corporate entities. Um, I also had the privilege uh, for four years to run ICANN, the institution that governs the logical infrastructure of the global internet. And during that time, I became, uh, uh, I got to know Mauricio and work with him. And I'll share with you a little bit today some of my experience in managing an innovation that happened almost by mistake, starting at UCLA and then in DARPA, funded by DARPA, that turned out to be the internet. Terrific. And, um, you know, as I was listening to today's speeches, um, a couple of uh, topics seem to be recurring. Uh, one of them is almost everybody's description of their journey involved an incredible amount of interdisciplinary and collaborative efforts. Mm -hmm. Rarely was just one invention sitting in one academic lab, the thing that then became not only the ultimate product or technology, but then that enabled its scale mm -hmm. to the point that they became a, 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 a global uh, trend. Just think of Bob Langer's journey with mRNA and the number of people of entities, companies, and collaborators, as well as years that went into ultimately making that a success. So this notion of interdisciplinarity, this notion of um, uh, collaboration, ecosystems, um, was something that kept striking me as, as we start thinking about what are the kind of innovations and what are the ingredients that make innovation not only global, um, but ultimately really disruptive. Mm. So we'll come back to that topic and, 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 uh, and talk a little bit about more, uh, more about it. But I guess since we're talking about megatrends, I would be super curious to hear fairly quickly from each one of you, what is a megatrend? Mm. And, and how is that different than any other innovation? Uh, is there a specific DNA to, uh, to things that become megatrends? Oh, sorry, um, I think, put simply, it's a major opportunity addressed. And so sometimes that opportunity is obvious and sometimes, you know, the, the entrepreneurs come up with an opportunity that everybody didn't know they needed, like our smart watches and, and everything else, we, all the devices we carry around with us. Liz? Yeah, I think um, speaking to the point about everybody, I think it, it's something that changes the way things are done across markets or gets adopted across markets. I think for it to be mega, it can't be kind of narrowly concentrated. So I think these things that either broadly reduce costs um, that, that uh, many markets are engaged in doing or 
um, improves like certain benefits across markets. So like maybe machine learning broadly reduces costs, maybe biotech broadly reduces benefits in healthcare. So I think that a cross market feature is really important. Hmm. Peter? I think that there are a couple of things that we should keep an eye on. Uh, we sometimes in economics talk about general uh, purpose technologies. There are things that enable all other technologies, electricity, computation, et cetera. And certainly we've heard today that uh, in the morning talks about the growth of certain types of mechanisms as a body of knowledge, sort of related, not one single thing, that represent that ecosystem of emerging new knowledge. And the second thing that I'd point to is exactly the point you just heard from Liz, which is it disrupts the current models for how we think we do the predecessors or the current version of those things. And that is the source of many of the forms of both commercial excitement, but also commercial uh, conflict that we see. Uh, and we may go back to that later, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just echoing what has been said. In my view, a mega trend is uh, something that has a transformative effect across a large uh, population. And it's something that touches many lives um, across the globe. Um, an example was that, I mean, in terms of technologies like internet, in terms of the medicine, probably discovery of, of antibiotics decades er earlier and so on. Yeah, very difficult to add to this because I agree. Um, it's the human impact and the purpose of the trend that makes it a mega trend. If it's fueled by, by that, it, it really catches on. Yeah, so you're all touching on this issue of scale. Mm. You know, it's interesting. I, I had a discussion about this very subject um, with uh, my old boss, Bill Gates, and I asked him, I said, you know, what, what is a megatrend? And he was also, of course, intent in recognizing the megatrends so that he could invest in them. <laughs> and he said, I don't know. I can't define it, but I know, I know when I see one. Okay. So, but I think fundamentally, you're all talking about scale. So maybe scale is a metric. And maybe reflective of the scale, you're talking about impact. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent, you're talking about breaking from convention, which means generally a megatrend is going to have this element of disruption, um, which may actually be the source of the innovation, mm. right? So recognizing the gap. And in talking to some of our young investigators, sometimes, uh, you know, beginners' minds they don't know enough about a problem so that they can approach it with a completely fresh mind mm -hmm. and it's an out of the box thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll come back maybe to that topic, Liz, since you're studying the process of innovation, I'm curious to see if that's a, that's a trend. Now, what, uh, what do you think that, are those basically the ingredients of, um, that make for a mega trend? And are those the ingredients that make it capable of disruption. I'm going to ask you, Liz, to maybe talk about that. Just seeing a problem in a new light. Uh, and, and also thinking about impact and scale. Yeah. Is, um, one, is, is, it a, is it the ingredient that allows it, or is, the, or is it a consequence? Mm -hmm. I do think it's hard to predict in advance how big the scale of an innovation is going to be, because um, it usually emerges in one specific context and um, to, that, to the initial inventor who might be very familiar with that specific context, you know, how it'll apply more broadly is, is unclear. So I don't think that's necessarily on the mind. It might be, you know, on the mind of investors. But um, I do think this, like, approach to, to thinking about a problem totally in a new way is really important. Um, and I think, like, what often happens is, like, all of a sudden a bunch of theoretical work will come together or, or will have advanced to a point where someone can, who's familiar with you know, several different bodies of work, can come and say, hey, I think, I think there is a new way of doing something. And, and maybe you know, it wasn't even hard to reach that, that conclusion given all these, all these new discoveries. So I think like, recombining knowledge in a new way is, is clearly very important. Um, and to do that, you have to kind of approach the problem in a new way, which I think was like a theme of the prior, prior talk as well. Um, and to our panelists, jump in if you mm. want to add or amplify or change or disagree. Um, 
going further on this, and I'm, I'm going to throw this one at uh, Fadi. Um, you kind of are part of a mega trend. I'm talking now back to your ICANN and, and internet days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was one driven by government. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you actually fought hard to change that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what is the role of government in fostering these type of mega trends and maybe getting into, out of the way? Uh, very hard to get governments out of the way because uh, once they get their fangs into something, it's, it's hard. But we did with the Internet. Um, as you know, um, UCLA is the birthplace of much of what we call the Internet today. It was not far from here when Steve Crocker, who's six foot four, used to carry Vint Cerf on his shoulders and have him uh, slide illegally through the windows of the computational center so they can go test their little ideas uh, just here. Uh, and then the internet. But of course, this was all funded by DARPA and by the US government. And the logical infrastructure of the internet, which is basically what controls and creates the, the existence of the internet, was in fact, until very recently, controlled by the US government. So the core, the root system of the internet, the, the core distribution of the parameters that make the internet work, all of this was under the thumbs of a US agency. And so I became the head of the institutions outside the US government that were at least the face of this to the world. And the invention came from, let's say, funding from the US government, but it became clear at some point that the internet cannot be contained within that circle. And uh, at the time, uh, at the request of the White House, I became the head of these institutions. And my job was to figure out how to create a balance between the role of the US government in this invention and the need for the internet to be freed so that the world can invest in it and trust it. Uh, and that was, I think, where Maurizio wants me to mention that this tension was very difficult. Of course, it became very difficult when Edward Snowden revealed a few things, and suddenly everybody wanted the U.S. government's hands out of the cookie jar. And that was my job, to actually find a balance at the time working with governments, working with civil society, working with innovators, until we found a new governance model that the U.S. government, the Chinese government, uh, the BRICS countries, major companies like Google accepted, and we were able to make that work outside the U.S. government control. Uh, so th th this is possible, but it takes collaboration, as you said earlier, between business, government, and in this case, it required civil society, because at the end of the day, we're all the internet. We make this environment work. And so that balance is difficult, possible. I spent some time at Harvard Kennedy and at Oxford teaching how we arrived at that balance between the, all the stakeholders. Uh, but it is feasible and it is possible. And do you think that it was the fact that that happened that allowed the growth, oh, the no, mega trend? No question about it. I think there was a point where the tension was so high. I mean, just for those of you who are interested in the space, the internet has a root system in 13 locations in the world, okay? So when this tension became very tight, it became clear people didn't know there was a root system. No, most people didn't know. Suddenly, Angela Merkel, for example, found out, and she found out none of these 13 roots are in Germany. And when she called me in, she said, well, why can't we have one in Germany? Well, so did Premier Li in China. He said, why don't we have one in China? And because 10 of the 13 are on US soil, two are in Europe and one is in Japan. And so these tensions were very real and it almost broke the root of the internet. I actually was in China and I was witness to an alternate route of the internet, a complete alternate route, right? So they were ready to turn it on, hmm. okay? And we avoided that. But uh, the, the pressures, uh, Maurizio, are, are very real, and we were able to diffuse them and avoid the breakup of the whole internet, which frankly would have completely changed the digital revolution as we see it today, um, because of collaboration, because of you know, calm minds, wisdom, 
and sitting down with all the stakeholders and bring, bringing them to the table. We used a lot of the pugwash principles that enabled the pugwash uh, resolutions that Einstein and others physicists had started. We used that model to bring together the various stakeholders and bring a collaborative solution. I can't help thinking, uh, as you're talking about the internet, I can't thinking about some of the controversies associated with global vaccines and, and adoption of vaccines at time of crisis, like during the pandemic, and some of the issues that ultimately relate to IPs and some of these other uh, topics, which is probably a good, uh, a good segue uh, to a question I wanted to address to Peter for a second. Um, so, you know, I know in your history, you have been a, a thought leader on the role of IPs. We had a little bit of a debate about IPs and should universities have IPs? And, you know, in your sort of Qualcomm journey, you, you <laughs> developed a whole methodology for scaling, again, a different uh, mega trend to, uh, around that. Do you care to share with the audience a little bit about your thoughts around IP? and maybe apply to biomedicine? All right. Uh, so there's nothing like IP to get people really ticked off in a hurry. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to put this in a larger context, maybe uh, building off the discussion of ICANN, where I was in uh, a number of the government economic agencies, uh, policy setting discussions that interacted with you. Um, so from the perspective of thinking about government and IP and companies in a moment of scientific technological disruption, there are a couple of things that are interesting. First is that this trend of the growth of computer networking that we now call the internet and the World Wide Web. Uh, for a long time, the US government really didn't know what it wanted, except for one thing. There were these computer companies that said they could do something really cool with computers being networked and there, were, there was AT&T and the other telecom companies in the world who wanted to fit it into a telephone box framework. And so the real defining debate initially about digital technology and government policy was, is it going to be tilted towards the image of computer networking? And then there, there was a battle about which form of computer networking. But computer networking in general or was it going to look like telecom companies making computer networking just sort of in a hyper extension of the phone network? Yep. And that battle played out, but in its being played out, it opened the space to not a detailed plan for what would happen with the explosion of mobile uh, technology <clears throat> or the particular byproducts of the internet, which was the breakdown of integrated telecom equipment makers into specialists like Cisco yep. or the software companies like Microsoft, et cetera, providing the value. I say all that in background because it then sets the framework for the, the story about IP and Qualcomm, which is really representative in my mind of what could happen in the biomedical space that I heard this morning. I'm not a biomedical expert. I've worked a lot with scientists over the years. And what I heard was this increasing growth of specialized capabilities being organized around IP. And with that, there's lots of value added segments that have to be brought together. So what happened in telecom was as mobile exploded, the big limiting factor for new mobile technology was you had to use spectrum efficiently to cram more and more traffic on any amount of spectrum. And it so happened this small company, Qualcomm, invented a better mousetrap about how to cram traffic onto any amount of uh, spectrum. In doing so, it took a big financial risk and invested in a R&D heavy model at a level that the industry had not seen after the breakup of AT&T and Bell Labs. So it was out there, and it had a better mousetrap protected by IP. It set off a firestorm internationally because Qualcomm's view was, we have the better mousetrap, that's our only product, we are selling the IP licensing rights to everybody to finance that. 
the industry had always operated on the equivalent of where Eli Lilly were selling a drug and all the inputs, they're all measured in their economic measures against the package of our final pricing model. And it's all been vertically determined by us how the pieces are going to be put together. This caused a huge battle over margins in the industry and over who, in a sense, had the intellectual agenda setting power for the industry. And that type of specialist versus generalist breakdown led to these fights over patenting. Now, you can take any view you want to about whether uh, Qualcomm's licensing rates were uh, appropriate. There have been lots of lawsuits about that. <laughs> But what happened here is fundamentally an important story for all innovation, which is by breaking the business model, big integrated companies like Ericsson or Nokia, controlling things from soup to nuts, even if they bought out specialists to integrate, versus big independent suppliers of specialized capabilities, you change the economic model of the industry it also opened the industry up to lots of new general inner, uh, uh, suppliers of equipment because now the chipset, which was the key barrier to entry, you could buy from a specialist independent of the general suppliers. Yeah. And those are the types of questions that I can imagine may emerge over time in the biomedical story I heard this morning. Yeah, and actually, that's a great segue, Paul. I wanted to right, throw yeah, so, it to you. Uh, right, challenge exactly. Comment on that. So, yeah, I think one, one of the driving forces, and if you want to call me in 40 years to see if I get this right, <laughs> yes. uh, is going to be healthcare disparities. So when pharma companies uh, do clinical trials, they try and take as narrow a population as possible. Let's take a, a cancer drug as an example. By by targeting who's most likely to be uh, positively affected right. by it, uh, they, you know, seek to get approval. At the same time, you know, other data for broader populations are quashed, mm -hmm. and then people don't get treated if they don't match the genetics. So the the disparity in breast cancer mortality for people of color comes from the hormone-based treatments being tested on narrow populations, and so I. You know, I see the big opportunity is doing end runs around these, you know, uh, you know, genetics is very broad. We don't, you know, the, the Human Genome Project, from the point of view of the original motivation, failed, right? We said we'd read the Book of Life and cure all diseases. Well, we read the Book of Life and we, we discovered it's really complicated <laughs> and that it opened up more questions and developed new technology that now we can compare, you know, a million different people or a thousand different species and you know, redraw the the tree of evolution. But what we didn't do was then, you know, discover the cure to every disease. Mm. And because of the way that the large pharma companies now uh, put together their packages and the way regulation works and so forth, that leaves people out. And so I think we're going to be coming up with end runs around that, where for a particular patient we test the efficacy of a particular drug and say, okay, well, you're not in that gene pool, but we're going to give it to you because it's going to work. And that, you know, that can address just in, you know, breast cancer as an example, 30 years of, of disparities. And so, you know, some of the work that uh, Ali has done and Don Engber at, at Wies and what we've developed in our lab for very efficient organoid growth to be able to do testing in hours or days uh, for specific patients and very, you know, greatly varied uh, diseases like pediatric brain cancer that's now the leading killer, there's an opportunity there that we'll be able to address by the technologies that we're developing, you know, here and at Terasaki and at, at Harvard and elsewhere. And so that opens up the world and, you know, back to the government part, right, the head of Biden's cancer advisory is uh, John Carpton over at USC, whose specialty is disparity in healthcare. And so now, you know, there's this convergence of both technology and policy that's going to help us move forward and, and that, you know, should bring treatment to, to the broader population. Yeah, and it strikes me how, um, you know, when you were sort of addressing this question, you spoke of a mega, not a mega trend, but a mega problem, 
mm -hmm. right? So exactly. healthcare access, disparity in healthcare. That's a fundamental issue that transcends a specific technology, a specific target, disease, etc. cetera. Um, so that stimulates a question that, and I apologize in advance because I didn't give you this question, but I, I trust, Nasli, you can address it out of your own journey. So as a scientist turned entrepreneur, at some point you must have decided that there was a problem worth solving. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, you know, did you take into account some of these mega trends, problems, issues in defining what ultimately became your companies? Yeah. Or, or did the company happen by accident and then you figured out the problem? Which, by the way, has happened to me in my right. entrepreneurial journey. But half of the companies I've created, I didn't really think about the problem. I had a technology and then I searched for a problem to solve with that technology. I'm just curious what your experience has been. Right. Um, the answer is yes. I was definitely influenced by, by this uh, trend that was happening around me. Probably I couldn't pinpoint it because I was young and kid and had no, no idea what was going on, but I was influenced by it subconsciously. Uh, I was at the NIH when the Human Genome Project was being mapped out, so uh, Dr. Collings was head of that, and there was a lot of excitement that, you know, we, uh, we um, uh, uncovered the human genome and, you know, everything will be solved. And it turned out to be, it opened up a lot more questions than answer. But through that experience, a lot of chatter that came up is that once we um, sequence the human genome, then we figure out the difference between people and how genes function differently from one individual to the other. So it was the beginning of the conversation of personalized medicine as how we can use the genome map back then, thinking that was possible, to make drugs that address different diseases in different individuals. That didn't happen because there's a lot of um, steps that from genome you can go to the design of a personalized treatment. But that kind of triggered the thought in me that when I am making this drug, how can I make the drug in patients that actually this drug would match on them? I knew that it wouldn't work for every individual, but the, the underlying idea was that the platform technology that I was building that later became the company, how can it can address a specific pathway in specific individuals? Because we are all different through our life journey. We go through through the changes. So I, I kind of knew that it has to it has to address that individual approach, the personalized medicine, how you tailor a treatment to a specific disease to a specific individual, and that's a mega trend that I think is happening. The thought, the, the, the thinking about it, started many years ago, and is just slowly going towards that. Cancer is a big example of it, the first example of it, mm -hmm. how we are using different pathway, different mutation in different patients to make a specific treatment to that. It was referred to in the talks earlier today. And I think now we've reached a point because of the sheer amount of data that is coming out and because of the machine learning and the AI, we are able to analyze it. So having all that data one side making sense of it, another, it's another beast. Um, it's the divergence of the biology and the technology that would allow us to make sense of all this data that coming out, coming out from the biological system to say, okay, this is the problem in this set of disease. How I'm gonna to address it using biological methodology and make a drug that, that would address that. So that was the big picture that I would try to address when I had my company. I mean, it was very naive at the beginning, but I just thinking that this, this, was, this would be the trend. And I think this more and more we go towards that path, that would be the mega trend. Just um, individualization, personalization of the treatment um, in the biological innovation, the divergence of these two trends, the data, machine learning, and the biology, and our understanding of biology. It's going to meet at some point, so we can we can really truly make those personalized and individualized uh, treatment. So you brought up an interesting point that I heard in many of the talks 
today, which is often the thing that makes the megatrend starts not necessarily with a, one individual product or solution, but it is actually a platform. Mm -hmm. It is some kind of platform that in many cases can enable a whole pipeline of product or a whole different approach. And I'm reminiscent of a meeting I had when I built my very first platform company in, on Sand Hill Road. And the, I had a meeting with uh, ABC that I will not mention. <laughs> and uh, you know, they basically stopped me halfway through the, the meeting and said, it's all fascinating, but we don't invest in platforms. What's your product? Okay, and that sort of attitude that platform requires a different investment model and a funding model, I think is very true even today. And so there's a number of you that are sort of monitoring or thinking about what are the funding mechanisms for Megatrend, which is a different way of saying what are the funding mechanisms for, for platform enabling technologies. Maybe Peter, I know you've been tracking philanthropy in this role, do you wanna say a couple of points on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so as a background for all of you, uh, it, it turns out that there is no comprehensive study of the way that philanthropy has influenced the behavior of the basic research system in the United States. And I don't mean that, oh, I tell a story about a hundred million dollar gift to this university or that, but how as a whole does this very large sum of money change the behavior of the overall system over time. And the amount of money from philanthropy has been vastly undercalculated. It used to be that people thought that the conventional amount of estimate was about $5.5 billion. In fact, uh, after we've been digging, we think the number is closer to about $17 billion, which is roughly equivalent to 20% of the US R&D budget support for universities and independent research laboratories in the United States. That's a lot of money flowing from a very dispersed group of agendas and organizations with different strategies. One of the biggest trends that you can observe over time, let me just cite two, there, there are a bunch. One is that uh, philanthropy as a whole has been a catalyst for the reorganization of research groups, especially for interdisciplinarity. Uh, it's been a major agenda for lots of givers in this space. It enables, if you would, ambitious universities and research laboratories to experiment with the people they hire and cluster in whole new ways. That's why we have many new types of academic departments hmm. in scientific research compared to 30 to 40 years ago, partly enabled by philanthropy. Mm -hmm. The second big impact of philanthropy that we've seen in more recent years is uh, the fact that, especially in biomedical, a lot, of, I'm gonna say something, I'm not a biomedical researcher, this is all what I've been told by biomedical researchers, that a lot of the money that comes out of NIH, et cetera, tends to be quite, uh, if you would, uh, stovepiped into very narrow, problems tied to very specific diseases. It's kind of incremental science at its most traditional level. It's not bad, but it's not what you would call basic. pushing basic stuff. What has happened with philanthropy today, especially with the rise of a new generation of mega donors, is they are focusing in on platform technologies for biomedical research and their applications and they're pushing for an reorganizations of groups to allow for this entrepreneurship. So in a way, they have more freedom to experiment with the form than the US government does, because at the end, although there are very clever people in the NIH, et cetera, who have big thoughts, they are responsible to Congress. And Congress is not in the business of saying, spend $100 million on some experimental platform that God knows if it's going to have high efficacy. It will allow it occasionally, but those are not the way that you start to see this type of broader experimentation. So I think this is one thing to watch. And I might add that when people talk about the competition 
between the U.S. and China for scientific leadership. Philanthropy is a factor that the United States has that mm -hmm. people have not thought about as a systematic differentiation from China. Yeah, excellent. And Fadi, you wear a different hat nowadays, which is the, that of an investor. Yeah. An investor in a private equity fund, um, I'll plug you, Ethos Capital, that has this vision of sort of unleashing transformation mm -hmm. between you know, around digital, of course, but, uh, but also beyond digital. How would you answer the same question about from, a, from an investor, a private equity investor, uh, or how you think about platform technologies and this concept of enabling, um, you know, a mega trend through, uh, through a platform? I think like Peter described philanthropy, as an investor, I look for platforms. I need platform technologies because we can't invest in products because products may fail. <laughs> but platforms uh, reduce risk, downside risk for us. Mm -hmm. So we look for platforms in everything we do. Um, we, we are investing in larger companies, but even those larger companies, we look within them for their technological platforms and also if they think as a platform. Because sometimes management teams also need to change the way they think about the markets they're serving. Um, I want to touch on something else, Mauricio, that's important because it relates to our experience in digital. Um, when a mega trend is happening and a company realizes they are in a mega trend, they face a very important question on the issue of governance and staying ahead of the governance space. Mm -hmm. And so it's important I just share this with you because I lived it. For example, some of you may agree with Meta and Google pushing as far as they can until somebody said, stop, you're going too much into people's bedrooms. You know, now, you know, rethink a little bit what you're doing. Um, versus them from the beginning stopping and saying, we're about, you know, to change the way people think, the way people live. What should we put as guardrails? And can we partner with government early enough to ensure that before the megatrend becomes the recognized megatrend, we have put the guardrails? Now, they chose not to. And these are different paths. I'm, I'm not saying one is right or wrong. These companies pushed the envelope all the way to the end, and it's only now that they have thousands of people in Washington to contain the, the backlash that they're getting. But at the beginning, they didn't. They actually ignored it. They said, hey, we, were, we're, you know, we have nothing to do with this. We're just bringing technology to the world. So thinking as you start seeing a megatrend and participate in creating one or pushing one further, thinking when you involve when you start thinking about the societal and economic guardrails and the policies that need to come out of that, and how much do you participate, shape this, or do you sit back until it's a, a storm? This is important for us to keep in mind, and I think the digital technology space has had different experiences that could uh, hopefully um, inform our biomedical revolution that is about to unfold here. So I want to leave some space uh, for the audience uh, to ask us question, but um, you know, since since we are, uh, we made the claim of predicting the mega trends in the bio space. I thought we'll pivot for a second and allow each one of you to sort of give us your thoughts. Nasli already mm -hmm. volunteered one. She thinks precision medicine is sort of one of those emerging mega trends around. Uh, around biomedical uh, applications. Um, you know, uh, I'm curious to get everybody's thought, uh, specifically for our biomedical innovators. Uh, where do you see the next revolution to be coming from? Paul, sure. Well, I already said, I think healthcare disparities are a driver. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll just amplify what, what Peter said. Everything interesting we've done in our laboratory has come from unrestricted funds or philanthropy. And hmm. only later uh, has federal funding, you know, pushed it along. We had to, we had to come up with the idea and uh, develop it and get off into a demonstration mm -hmm. before we were ever able to secure federal funding in, in every area, not just biomedicine. 
Awesome. Yeah. Um, related to personalization, I think personalization in mental health uh, treatment seems um, right for innovation. Um, you know, I'm going to say something climate related to the extent that it's relevant. I think we've seen in the past year a, a huge explosion of startup activity in geoengineering, also some um, not great um, experimentation with geoengineering, but I think that's a sign that things are going to happen in that space. Um, and then I think healthy longevity is, is a big area for um, a mega trend. So I have absolutely no basis for this projection whatsoever, <laughs> except when you know one thing, everything is a hammer if you're a nail. So I think it, it's going to be, at least in one dimension, the fact that, as we heard this morning, the ability to sense everything around you so that there are predictable ranges of environmental and biomedical, if you would, spatial experiences around you is going to get integrated with this idea of precision medicine mm -hmm. so that the more that you can differentiate the individual cases that are environmental because data is cheap to observe and put together combined with the medical differentiation ought to open uh, novel problems and uh, refining of what we think a disease is even. Awesome. I will just touch on artificial intelligence because that's my background. I do think that generative AI and the new technologies we're seeing emerge will fuel and speed the, the, the research into almost any field in ways, frankly, we can't predict. I mean, I've been in technology for not as long as Peter, but uh, Peter is probably the most experienced here, but for many decades. And I, I don't, since the Mosaic browser, I've never seen anything that really struck me as transformative as what we're seeing today happen in AI. It is really remarkable. And I think if we, in any field, including obviously biomedical, if we don't appreciate how much AI is going to fuel what we do and enable it and put it, it's almost like putting a rocket ship on most research uh, and understand it. And I met a young man at lunch who was telling me he's doing that. Uh, uh, Ismail, and I, I wish you luck because you're bringing AI to the space as well. So uh, important, important bit of new technology here. And Leslie, did you want to add anything to your prior comment? Uh, no, I think that that will be the future, not only in medicine, but uh, uh, also I think in mega trends that would be related to the environment, to, mm. to food industry. There's a lot of tectonic tectonic changes happening all around us, but it will all stem, a, you know, a convergence of the data, machine learning, with whatever knowledge we have, whether it's biomedical, whether it's uh, um, environmental. Um, I, I cannot fathom how it's gonna shape, but I'm sure, for sure it's gonna happen in what shape and form we shall see. We shall see. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, by the way, I was very pleased. Um, I'm going to do some shelf, uh, uh, shameless self-promotion for the Tarasaki Institute, but I was very pleased by your uh, predictions because most of the programs that you've hinted at are actually the core of the platforms that we are investing mm -hmm. in. Yep. And it's also important to point out that while the Tarasaki Institute uh, is very lucky to enjoy the endowment and the generosity of the philant philanthropic family, the Tarasaki family. Uh, and certainly, you know, so we also fit that model of the philanthropy and it took philanthropy to do things differently than an academic institute yeah. inside a university normally living strictly by the, uh, the NIH whims. Uh, that's not to say that the NIH is not a huge contributor yeah, to our right. programs as well, but, uh, but so, so I think we sort of typify exactly the kind of environment that you've, uh, you've discussed. And I think some of the other independent institutes that are doing this type of translational applied work that were mentioned earlier, the WIS and, and others, uh, all sort of share in the same DNA in yep. terms of structure. Um, I'll stop here and I'll open it up uh, to any Questions from the audience. Oh, thank you for um, the amazing panel. I've had this question for years, so I want to ask you this question too. So, in soft tech and tech, we've seen like 
16 years old, 18 years old, 22 years old, they drop out and they disrupt their, some industry or they develop a new industry like Facebook or uh, Scale AI, Figma. But we haven't seen this in biotech. And we don't have like a Steve Jobs in biotech that like goes and like, you know, revolutionize it in a couple of years. Why do you think that's not happening in biotech and how can we make it happen? I want to quickly say something about this like, I think common knowledge fact that's not a fact. The average age of entrepreneurs even in the tech industry is 40. So th these are like outliers. Um, and I think they're visible because they're in consumer products and they represent things that we see in the media. They're very visible. So I think that's important to, to, to keep in mind. Um, but I don't know the specifics of um, game changers in the biotech industry. So. Uh, anybody wants to venture? Uh, yeah, um, an answer? because you know the product that the biotech entrepreneur will present, it takes. Remember Dr. Langer's uh, talk, forty years. <laughs> it takes that long. You know, when I look back from my journey, from the when I'm, from the time that the idea was kind of percolated in my mind until. It's, gate, it's got to the late stage approval of kind of 16 years. It's just, you don't stay long, you, you don't stay young forever. Even you start young by the time, <laughs> by the time you have something to show for, you're not young anymore. Just the life cycle of the products in biotech industry just take so long, no well, matter how early you start it. Yeah, but, but this is a bit the point I was saying about AI. I think AI, when used and if used, in a lot of that work and research is going to create, um, I think, a, a factor of speed that we have not seen yet, uh, and hopefully bring the 16 years down a few. A uh, few more years, yes. yeah. But the challenge with that is, which um, probably AI would help, hopefully it would, uh, how we cut down on the number of years that one need to do clinical trials. Yes. That's the time that, um, there's, there's nothing that can replace the actual clinical trial when you develop a drug, and that's years. Mm -hmm. Hopefully AI, some uh, intelligent design of the clinical trial would shave some years off of it, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the time that you spend, that's yeah, it's just required. You cannot tell a drug works. You have to do this experiment. Does this drug work or not in the actual real life in, in patients, and mm -hmm. that takes years. Mm -hmm. I think Paul, to get into humans, right, there's a depth of knowledge that's harder. I and mean, we have some amazing high school students who work with us who come, you know, with uh, more than, you know, I remember undergraduates or even starting graduate students uh, having at hand, but still both the skills and then the access uh, to, you know, information, samples, and so forth, that's pretty hard to do when you're in high school uh, and not associated with any, you know, hospital or, mm. or uh, you know, another place where you'd get samples you might need. Can I just uh, note that when you have a disruptive moment, both in economic terms and also technologically, one of the things that happens is your notion of how you test and validate to deal with safety and other considerations starts to be subject to stress and innovation. So for example, uh, think about consumer electronics where the underwriter's laboratory has had to continually adapt. Yeah. And it is not a government agency. Nope. It is funded mm -hmm. by industry because having some way that you can show to the insurance industry that you have met product liability prudential safeguards is essential. So I wouldn't be surprised, at least for biomedical equipment, that we don't start to see some ways in which it is either you skirt the FDA by, you know, designing it a certain way to avoid it being an FDA area, or it's sort of a wild west that we start to see new types of specialized testing and certification uh, arrangements. I have no idea what they would be, but it's typical of these eras. Yeah, and, and to that point, um, most of you may have caught the new guidance from the FDA relating to the use of uh, uh, patient-derived avatars and organs in a chip, which is now being viewed by the FDA almost preferentially toward the submission of uh, 
uh, new indications uh, over doing classic animal testing okay. and all those other things. So it doesn't get away from doing clinical trials, mm -hmm. but right there is potentially a huge accelerant yep. Uh, which could be unleashing a new mega trend in terms of yeah. drug discovery and drug development. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there is an evolution, but I, but I think the, the short of it is the infrastructure you need and the regulated environment that you need to build your next app is considerably different than what you need to build your next mm -hmm. drug. Yep. Yeah. And, and that includes the millions of dollars worth of core infrastructures that may be needed to do the tinkering, yeah. uh, which is probably why you don't see the agility and velocity that you see in the classic tech uh, business. Any other questions? She's giving you the mic. Okay. Um, having two kids in medical school, I, I don't know if it's a mega trend, but nobody in medical school wants to become a general practitioner. They all want to become specialists, orthopedic, uh, dermatology, you name it. And, I was one, and, and yet, all of us, when we go to see a doctor, the first contact is going to be a general practitioner, mm -hmm. right? What are you going to do about this mega trend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, you're totally right. And I think um, it seems to transcend whether it's a private or a public healthcare system. Uh, as you know, in the US, we have that debate. Uh, but I can tell you, I sit on a Blue Ribbon Commission by the National Health Service of the UK um, that is, was actually chartered to study the future of the NHS uh, for the British Prime Minister. And what we discovered is that 70, 70 percent of the patients in British hospitals will be better off at home seeing a primary care practitioner in terms of outcomes. So we have a healthcare system that pushes people into specialized care and acute care, and it's not necessarily in the best interest of the patient. Um, it goes back to, I think, the trend you're saying, which mm -hmm. is equity of access and, and ultimately delivery. Uh, we have economics, I think, to sort of act as a forcing function because, uh, because uh, it's getting too expensive, and we pretty much, have, you can pick the country, uh, the single most likely source of a national default is the escalating cost of healthcare and it seems to transcend the type of system they have. And so primary care has to be reevaluated, has to be revitalized, and it has to be ultimately used much more effectively in, in creating equity in access and, and improved outcomes. Um, it, we're not the biomedical innovators, you are. Mm -hmm. So take that as, a, as a, a recipe for finding your next big innovation. Okay, we are three minutes and 11 seconds over, so uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Mauricio.